What's wrong, babe? I don't know. I was just thinking it's so crazy. Like 20 years ago, we had Johnny Cash, Bob Hope, Steve Jobs, you know? Now we have no cash, no hope, and no jobs. It's sad. Well, wait. There is hope. Look, look. Check this out. What is that? Oh, wow. Vans built up a loyalty program with 10 million members in just two years with Cheetah Digital. Right? And members spend 60% more than non-members. And in a recession, who... Who doesn't love a good loyalty program? I love a loyalty program. You're my loyalty program. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I love you. I love I'm you a, too. I'm in your program for life. <laughs> no, you're stuck with me. VIP, all the way. I love you. <laughs> Nine times as many U.S. consumers want to participate in more loyalty programs this year. Join us at Signals 20 to learn how leading brands turn customers into advocates, even in the toughest of times. Signals 20, the content series for marketing rock stars. Signals 20, the content series for marketing rock stars. Welcome to Signals 2020. I'm John Siegel, Senior Vice President at Cheetah Digital, responsible for our loyalty solutions business. And this week is all about loyalty. And I cannot think of a better way to start off the week than with our guest today, Emily Collins, Research Director at Forrester. Emily and I are going to discuss in depth how to create a loyalty strategy, not just a rewards program. Let's dive right in. Emily, good to speak with you again. You too. Uh, Emily, when I go visit a client for the first time, very often I'll look at their loyalty program and it feels like they just checked the box that like no one has thought about how to use loyalty to create some sort of competitive advantage. And I was really interested when I read um, about the maturity model that you had developed at Forrester, uh, because I think, it, I think it's a great way for brands to understand where they're at along the loyalty journey uh, and how to ad advance or, or progress. And I'd really love for you to share with our audience, you know, the maturity model, how does it work? Uh, you know, just give us the background on it and we'll, we'll go into some more detail, I'm sure, as we go. Yeah, no, that's great. So the model is really designed to help organizations um, determine and assess their loyalty strategy, regardless of whether or not they have a loyalty program. Because as you know, um, a loyalty program is a tactic, not a strategy in and of itself. And so I think what happens is, is that you, you see that a lot of organizations have built these programs. I mean, most retailers and airlines at this point are on version five and six of their programs, right? They were started as more frequency-based rewards programs. Um, and as consumer expectations have increased and sort of this convergence of marketing and CX coming together, it's really that they have needed to evolve their approach because consumers don't really think about their interactions with the brand as, oh, now I'm interacting with marketing or, oh, now I'm interacting with service. They think about them as interactions with the brand. And so ultimately, the this is really important when you're thinking through your loyalty strategy because it's really critical that companies today embrace more of a loyalty company mindset versus a rewards and incentives mindset. So the, the maturity model is really designed to help companies assess where they are today um, and how to evolve their approach, not just their loyalty program. Why do you think so many brands get caught in that beginner stage? Um, the brands in the beginner stage are really focused on tactical loyalty. So they're obsessed with you know, what the program offers, really designing sort of that value exchange. Um, you know, it's Loyalty is really seen and treated as one marketing program alongside email and other maybe channel marketing efforts. Um, and so it can be difficult to break loyalty out of that because loyalty teams are sort of given their marching orders and their objectives. And there's not necessarily that, that bigger picture of how do we then coordinate all of these things to ensure that we're delivering value for the customer versus just driving increases in incremental revenue or purchased purchase metrics. Great. Um, let's drill into the model in a little bit more detail. Maybe we could start with the competencies or the building blocks and then maybe move on to the actual stages themselves. Yeah. So the way that we've designed this model is to assess maturity across six core competencies. So I'm just gonna pull up a slide really quick. 
And on that slide, you can see that there are six blocks. So there's the strategy block, which is to say, you know, that the company has a defined strategy and objectives for um, increasing loyalty that tie to the overall business goals, right? As I mentioned before, this is not just a marketing thing. This is a company thing of, of a customer strategy, not just a marketing strategy. And then there's um, the research competency, which is really important to base whatever you do in a deep and granular understanding of your customer. So making sure that you are analyzing any data that you have about customers, um, not just behavioral data, but really digging into what motivates your customers, why they're loyal to you in the first place. Um, and then on the flip side, as you start to enact your strategy, making sure that you have uh, some sort of um, feedback loop. So you can start to collect customer input and customer feedback on what you're doing to ensure that it continues to stay relevant and actually is delivering meaningful value for them. The third competency is around process. So if you think about loyalty as an enterprise-wide responsibility, there are a lot of teams that are customer facing that need to be involved to make sure that you can deliver a consistent and customized customer experience to those loyal customers. Um, and so these are the processes that you need to encourage collaboration, as well as things like data and insight sharing. So as you collect information from your loyal customers, how are you packaging that and sharing that across the information to optimize everyone's efforts? Um, the fourth block is around technology, which you know, I'm, I'm going to caveat this a little bit because oftentimes marketers are like, oh, I need a new tool to make this better. The technology competency is really around how integrated and connected are your tools for, for empowering or enabling those experiences. So kind of thinking through how do we make sure that we're not creating silos of insight, that we're not creating a single channel experience, um, that it's really a connected ecosystem. Um, then we have measurement which helps you understand how well what you're doing is actually working. Um, and here, what's really important is to think about measuring not just what customers are doing, but also how they feel about those interactions that they have with you to really gauge the quality and depth of the relationship. And then the last competency is around people. So ensuring that your employees have the training, the coaching that they need to really um, deliver the kinds of experiences that cement customer loyalty, and that there's a great relationship or a good working relationship amongst all of the different internal and external groups that are involved in execution. So those are the competencies. What about the actual stages themselves? Can you talk about that? Yeah, so we have three maturity levels. Um, so, you know, when organizations take this maturity assessment, um, there's a bunch within each of these six competencies, there's two to four questions. And so it will kind of give people a sense of, of not just their overall maturity, but different areas where there might be gaps. You know, is it that we don't have great communication or alignment across all the different stakeholders internally? Um, you know, are we not incorporating enough customer research. Maybe you do a lot of research in the upfront, but you're not collecting that feedback. So there's some really specific different um, pitfalls or strengths that might be revealed. And we, we look at uh, the maturity across three levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. I know, super um, technical terms. <laughs> um, but I'm gonna show you a slide now that shows the different stages of maturity. And so in the beginner stages, um, companies that fall into this phase, as I had mentioned before, tend to have very siloed and transactional loyalty programs, right? Really focused on the rewards, the incentives, what is offered to the customer, that value exchange. And, you know, there may have been some customer research or ROI models that were used to build the program or maybe make business cases for enhancements, but there's not a lot of that granular customer understanding to fuel optimization. In the intermediate stage, I would say you have companies that have started to evolve their approach where their loyalty program is connected to the broader, at least marketing ecosystem and maybe customer service from a collaboration perspective and execution perspective. And um, the program is oriented and their tactics are oriented at addressing both 
emotional and behavioral loyalty, whether that's coming through um, maybe some qualitative customer research, um, whether that's the incorporation of more experiential benefits and really enhancing the experience that loyal customers get, or it comes through in the measurement where they're including both behavioral and some emotional metrics to measure the quality of the customer relationship. And then the advanced stage are companies that have embraced more of that loyalty company mindset, right? Everything that they do is rooted in a data-driven understanding of what and why customers, what makes customers loyal or why they're loyal. And their strategies, whether it's a loyalty program or something else, are executed um, with integrated resources and tools. So as a brand moves from one of these stages to the other, you know, say from beginner to intermediate, what would you suggest the impact to the business would be? So what I can really see here is that when companies evolve their maturity, they're moving from a place where loyalty is just a synonym for retention to one where um, it's more about creating the kinds of experiences that earn loyalty and it's a long-term solution, not just a, an excuse to, to deliver more offers or to have a, you know, a better access to the customer. So it's really about securing those high quality customer relationships, um, as well as connecting it back to that, um, the, the acquisition, right? So loyalty isn't just the end of the funnel. There is a distinct connection that you can make between the customers who are most loyal to you and the kinds of customers that you want to acquire next. And so ultimately, when you think about um, those advanced companies, they're enhancing the value of their efforts for both customers and the company. They're creating more of that win-win situation versus value to the business at the cost of the customer experience. It feels to me like a lot of brands actually have an awareness problem. They don't realize what they don't know. So they may be in that beginner stage and may not even understand that there's some, some things that they could be doing that's better. Do you, do you agree with that? You know, I would say if this were like three or four years ago, I would definitely agree. I think that with the rise of a lot of organizations evolving what they're even calling their loyalty programs now, right? They're calling them more membership programs or they're adding benefits around exclusivity and access. I would say that we've probably seen a shift you know, that there are more and more companies moving into the intermediate stage, but certainly a dearth of loyalty companies that advance stage. Um, but I think in the past two or three years, we've seen a little bit of a shift where companies understand that they need to be trying to build more quality relationships. Um, I think that getting over the hump from beginner to intermediate is definitely a challenge because there's a lot of inertia within the organization um, that kind of prevents some of those foundational steps from, from taking place. So this maturity model is a great roadmap for brands. How would you suggest a business get the most out of it? How would they use it, do you suggest? Yeah, I mean, the best way to, to get the most out of it is to take it, right? To take the assessment, to see where your gaps are, um, and not just to see where your gaps are, but then to go one step further and say, what are the next steps that we'd have to take to overcome or close this gap? Um, and if there's not a gap, celebrate the win, right? I mean, <laughs> you want to make sure that you're not just focused on what you don't have. Um, I think a great exercise that every organization can do regardless of maturity is to really start to think about developing a vision for customer loyalty at their organization. Um, loyalty means different things to different people. And that's true of, you know, whether that's an execution issue or not, for different companies, a loyal customer might look different um, depending on your industry, your company, um, where you are in the marketplace or the market in terms of competition. Um, and so I think it's really important that even if it sounds good to say, yes, we want to earn our customers loyalty, people often differ on how and by what means. So setting that loyalty vision that focuses on you know, what do we, what does it mean to be a loyal cu customer? What does it mean to embrace a, a loyalty company mindset? And that vision should incorporate things that are both company facing as well as customer facing, right? How do we want to make customers feel? Um, so I think that would be really, that's a really important step. Excellent. Let's shift gears a little bit. And I want to talk about personalization. And one of the things we think about quite a bit at Cheetah Digital 
is this idea that every customer has something unique about them and that the loyalty program needs to understand that and, and be able to act upon that. Yeah. And I'd love to get your thoughts about how loyalty marketers should think about personalization. So I when done well, personalization can help loyalty marketers be more personal, right? They can kind of move away from this very, this person is defined by their behavior and their transactions. And if you have the right information, you can start to um, use personalization to direct your interactions to where the customer is going and not just where they've been. Um, so I think that personalization can be a really effective tool in helping um, cement those trusted relationships and, and show consumers that you're that you hear them, that you see them, that you want, that you can appreciate them and reward them for their for their business that they're actively choosing to give you. In one of your recent reports, Emily, you wrote that personalization is too purchase obsessed. Can you explain what you meant by that? Sure. So what I mean by that is that oftentimes personalization and a lot of the tools that power personalization start with what the business wants to get out of it. Um, they're very business focused, which yes, of course, we all need to drive value to the business, but they often think of the customer last. And what, you know, what's really important is to kind of put the customer first and their needs first, and then think about how you can deliver value to them. Um, but right now you see this happening all the time, right? Brands need to drive, marketers are asked to drive that short-term value to the business. And the best way that they know how to do that is to send offers and promotions. And then they're using personalization to kind of put that into hyperdrive. And so that's where I think, you know, when they're so focused on the business objectives, it's really easy for personalization to focus on that buy phase uh, and that promotional uh, interaction. One of your colleagues at Forrester, uh, Char, talks about customer obsession. Uh, how can marketers advance customer obsession with the proper personalization? Yeah, so that's... That's a really good point because when done well, personalized experiences um, actually embody two key principles of customer obsession, customer led and insights driven. So when you think about personalized experiences where you're guiding, extending and enhancing the customer's experience based on their profile, preference, maybe some zero party data, um, that, that is very customer led and insights driven. Um, so if you approach it with that customer needs first, then you're definitely going to make progress on becoming a little bit more customer obsessed or at least more customer committed because customer obsession is really about using your customer focus as a differentiator. Um, so even if you, it doesn't put you into that customer obsessed category, it certainly can help you become a little bit more customer committed. You also wrote in one of your reports, um, use personalization to drive loyalty and customer obsession. You talked about the three R's of personalization. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so um, the three R's are really about making sure that you can deliver relevance, right? Everyone is thinking about relevance, but when you step back, if you're constantly begging your best customers with to make another purchase, that's not very personal. Your, your, your loyal customers are already likely planning to consider you for their next purchase. Um, and so relevance is really relevant to them where they are and to them as a person and their interests and needs, not just relevant in a moment where you think you can get them to buy again. Um, res delivering resonance is really about delivering that emotional connection or um, creating that memorable experience that drives loyalty. So I always love to talk about this where, you know, if you ask anyone now, granted, all of us are probably desperate to get back on a plane again um, and travel for business and just kind of experience like some room service and, you know, a quiet hotel room. Um, but if you think about when you ask someone, what are you, what airline are you most loyal to? A lot of times you would sort of get an answer that's like, well, I'm most loyal to United or American, but I don't really like them very much, right? The, if you ask someone kind of, they'll often have maybe a personal anecdote of, a, of an experience where they, um, a pilot or a, a, flight, a flight staff made it right for them 
in that moment, help them in a moment of need. Those sort of anecdotes are the kind of resonance I'm talking about. Something that's memorable, that really sticks with that customer and kind of adds resiliency to the customer relationship. And then the last one is restraint, right? So we have all of this information. Brands want I don't doubt that brands don't have the best of intentions when it comes to personalization. They are trying to deliver better experiences for their customers, even if it ends up looking like a promotion or offer most of the time. But what ends up happening is in execution, they're often is where they get tripped up. And not all customers want personalization. So restraint is really about respecting your customer's preferences so that you're not eroding that trust. Sometimes the most personal thing you can do is not use personalization. Um, and actually on slide number four, we have, um, we've seen that uh, the majority of consumers now are taking active measures to prevent brands from collecting their information. They're very aware that brands want their information to use for marketing and advertising. And when we ask why, 37% of them say they want to prevent their online and mobile activity from being shared with advertisers. So consumers are very savvy. Um, and so in some cases, restraint might look like not sending anything. And in others, it might just mean you don't have to send your loyal customers a huge long email. Um, you know, really respecting their preferences, knowing their preferences and showing that you understand um, what they prefer from an interaction standpoint. When you're talking about resonance, it was making me think of my own <laughs> anecdote that I had with American Airlines. Yeah. Recently. And it's very powerful. I mean, uh, I'm an exec platinum because I do travel a lot for business. I don't get room service when I travel, unfortunately. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they called me when COVID-19 hit and obviously they saw I wasn't traveling. And they were just calling to say, hey, how are you doing? And how are you feeling about traveling? And it was, I usually don't respond to surveys typically, but it was more of a personal conversation that I felt like here was the brand reaching out and wanting to truly understand how I was doing. And honestly, I think about that when I think about American Airlines, that's a, it's an experience that really sticks out in my mind. Yeah. So excellent. Well, and just like this whole notion of empathy, right? Like every brand right now is tuning their messaging. So even if you think you're being empathetic, you sound just like everybody else, but that sounded like, that interaction, they they did some outreach to you. They kind of showed that they value how you're feeling um, and also that they kind of missed you. <laughs> I'm sure they do. <laughs> I flew yeah. a lot. So, um, you know, I've also uh, heard people say, and I think you said this uh, in, in some of your writing, that um, starting uh, with, you know, your loyalty customers is a great group to start personalization with? Why do you think that is? Because they like you already. I mean, they have, they, they already like you. Um, you know, you already ostensibly have a lot of information collected about them. Um, they, they're more engaged than your average customer. You, if they're part of a loyalty program, you already have an opted in permission-based relationship to market with them. And in some ways you can pull them into the fold, right? I mean, it's, you don't need to be like the man behind the man or woman behind the green curtain um, with your loyal customers. You already have a relationship established. Um, I did a, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of like, a, if you're going on a first date, you don't reveal that you've completely looked at their entire internet history and their social media profiles. You know, you, you kind of save that for later on. You use that first interaction to be curious and ask them questions. I don't think you ever them. actually admit that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't admit it. Um, and with your loyal customers, it's the same way. You've hopefully had a longer term relationship where now there's some trust established where you can start to be more personalized and you can ask them for candid feedback. And I'm sure they'd love to give it to you. You know, that makes them feel special in a way. So, you know, another idea related to all of this that you hear people talk about, um, you know, the customer journey. Mm -hmm. um, so how does personalization and the customer journey, you know, fit together or don't they? Oh, I mean, they certainly fit together, right? So if you, we talked a little bit about personalization be too purchase, being too purchase obsessed, and that's because everyone's focused on the buy phase, right? How do we, how do we do trigger an offer at the right time to, to push that, to push that buying interaction? But there's actually so many different areas of the interaction that you may have with customers in between when they make purchases that can still deliver that value to them. And actually I have a slide here um, that kind of shows 
how to put the customer and their needs first and, and gives you some ideas of different ways that you can deliver personalized interactions across the life cycle or across that customer journey, right? It, it, sometimes it's, I think you might need this and here's an offer. Um, other times it might be, I have information to help you when you're um, considering all your options, right? Um, kind of really personalizing that exploration journey. Or um, when they're using your product or service, simple, providing them with things that can simplify something for them, personalized service or, you know, usage, um, you know, there's, I think some of the um, electronics companies have very detailed kind of customer lifecycle marketing um, based on just the journey of usage of, a, of an electronics device. Um, and then also in that engagement phase, making sure that you are kind of showing customers that you care about them, right? That there's this authentic appreciation that they are sticking with you and choosing to stay. Last question for you. Okay. If you're a brand and you're not satisfied with your current set of loyalty related initiatives, what's the first thing you should go do? Talk to some customers. The first thing I would do is go get a pulse on how customers feel about it. Um, you know, yeah, you can go look at the behavioral data, but ultimately you want to know how does your program today make them feel? Does it make them feel appreciated? Does it make them feel rewarded? Does it make them feel valued? Um, does it increase their trust? So really focusing on that, you need that customer uh, perspective to move forward. Awesome. Emily, thank you so much. This has been great information for all of our guests and, and listeners participating at Signals 2020. Uh, look forward to speaking to you again real soon. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. Signals 20, the content series for marketing rock stars.